basement. So, quick little project today. I have just received delivery, poorly packaged, dropped off in the rain, upside down, but I have just received delivery of one of these Italian 30 kilogram, 66 pound anvils. This was reviewed by Christ Centered Ironworks. Mine is just the way he described his. It is in fact a hardened steel. It does in fact have a ring and I'm, I'm going to be making it useful for the shop. Now before I completely get it mounted to a stand and do stuff to it that makes it difficult to operate on, I'm going to go ahead and get it ready for work. Chiefly among that is I'm going to get rid of this nasty blue paint and make it something that's a lot more pleasing to the eye. I'm not generally big on aesthetics, but if I'm going to work on it, I might as well work on it. Secondly, I'm going to mount it to the milling machine and I'm going to be milling a step right here. I already have a line scribed that I was going to do it with a grinder. I actually started cutting a groove here and I realized that it's really going to be more work to fool around with the grinder and try to get it right than it would be to just mount it in the milling machine and run through with a ceramic insert milling head and just go ahead and clean it out with the milling machine. Then this round horn needs to be reworked. It's not at all smooth. I will get it smoothed out, shined up to where you can do clean work without leaving indentations and that on the work that you put on it. And finally, soften these edges. I can actually feel very hard edge there, even from a machining standpoint, that's too hard of an edge. It should have been chambered. So I will take the flat disc and just soften those edges up. And if, if removing the paint hasn't already helped, I'll probably clean these edges up here to make them flat-ish so that anything that I'm driving over the edges, I'm getting uh, you know, onto a nice flat surface. And then we'll mount it to an anvil stand, and then I intend to make that stand mobile. So, thought you might want to tag along. First step is to get it mounted into the milling machine and get the milling cutter installed in the machine. All right, so fortunately for me, this base is exactly six inches across. This is a six inch machinist vise. For whatever reason, it doesn't open quite to six inches. I wonder if maybe the casting down inside there that's riding the lead screw, I wonder if it's a little bit, um, needs to be cleaned up, you know, and, and it's bottoming out before it's supposed to. But at this moment, I'm not going to tear it apart to answer that question. I have simply removed the back jaw and I'm just tightened up against the, the regular block that's here. I also have had to remove one of my three feed arms because it was striking right here when I tried to bring the head down. And of course I've removed the ER40 collet holder that I normally keep in here and installed this R8 taper a ceramic insert. These points on here are a little dull, so I'm going to try cutting a bit. If it's not cutting well or clean, I will clock each of these three, you know, one click and that will give a, a, a fresh cutting edge there at the bottom. But I only have one good cutting edge left. It's already been clocked once, so I really hate to use it up if I don't have to. We'll see how this Rockwell, you know, 50C or 55C, whatever this is, we'll see how these cutters do against it in their slightly dull state. I have lowered the mill head down as low as it can be and still clear here because that's going to increase my rigidity. A lot of you may already know that one of the challenges with a round column mill is a lack of rigidity. This heavy iron column is pretty strong but when you have all this weight torqued out over this and then you're applying this vibration input here, chatter is very common with a mill like this, especially taking what's sure to be a very hard cut. So the lower you can get the head, that's less of this material to flex. In fact, it would probably be arguably better to mount the anvil here on the actual table, bring the head down even farther. But the head only travels about nine inches at a time using this collar that has dog screws that bite in. So I would have to 
take the time to mount this to the table, get it squared with the head, drop the, actually, you know, lower this lifting collar to bring the milling machine down into a lower category. And for all the extra time that would take, I don't think it would make a meaningful enough difference for me to take the time to do it. And so let's turn the machine on and do some cutting, see how it goes. There we go. A nice step, nice unencumbered access to our pritchel hole. Later, if I want to, I can make an insert that will kind of ride this landing around this pritchel hole and be level with this surface here. So if I want to lay something across and punch down through it, it'll be level. Next step is to with the flat disc. Now that we have the anvil itself cleaned up, let's move on to the anvil stand. So recently, during a storm, a big tree, a big oak, fell across a road that's on my way home. When I drove through there, there were several big logs laying across the road. And I said to myself, those would be good for someone with firewood. And I got thinking later, one of those might be great for an anvil stand. So I drove over there. The logs are still laying in the ditch near a, a property with no home on it or anything. They've been there for over a week. And the only things left were too large for me to physically uh, navigate into the truck. Big 24 and greater inch diameter that would need to be cut with a saw before I could possibly even get them in the truck. So that was a bust. But it turns out that it took down a telephone pole as well. And this piece of a telephone pole was still laying there. Now, this is actually ideal for my purposes because it's nice and round, it's nice and circular. It is fairly lightweight uh, and fairly small footprint, so it doesn't take up a lot of floor space. Floor space is at a premium for me. It wouldn't be great if I was going to forge things all day long every day. Hardwood would give me a better support base for the anvil, less movement, less vibration. But considering the trade-off that my shop is very small and that I do very little forging, I think it's just right. Having said that, it has a problem. The problem is that the reason this piece was left behind is because this was the base of the pole where the pole itself actually kind of shattered. So you can see here in the top that we have a, a big split here that travels most of the distance down towards the base, not all the way to the very base. And we have this split off here that there again travels most of the distance. So one of the things I did off camera is I put a goodly amount of wood glue down in here. I drove some 20 penny spikes in which I dulled before I drove them in so that they don't split the fibers too much. And then I have spikes, I have toenail spikes in several places, kind of trying to lock this together. So I've given it some thought. And for this thing to hold up long term, what I'm going to do to it is I'm going to give it some steel bands at the top and at the bottom. If I can lock it in with a steel band providing inward tension, inward pressure, then I think the thing will hold up long term. Now for any of you who have watched a wheelwright at work like Engel's Coach Shop, you know that the way to do it is to measure around this distance using the known 
coefficient of thermal expansion of steel, cut the steel to a length that's a little bit less than the distance around, weld it together, heat the steel up three, four hundred degrees, and then it will just slide on, and when it cools, it will contract and suck in. I know that that's the way to do it. A couple problems in my case. Number one, I don't have that handy traveler wheel that he has that tells you the exact uh, diameter. And in fact, because we have some revetments, some, some stick outs, I'm not sure I could really trust the diameter that the thing tells me anyway. I don't want to take the time to mount it up in a wood lathe and turn it round in order to get a really clean, measurable diameter. <clears throat> it's just not worth all that effort. And finally, I don't really have a good way to heat a ring like that up to that temperature to place it on. I would go through a whole lot of oxyacetylene to, to heat something like that up that hot. So I'm going to go a different route. And I'm going to basically build a, a band clamp that uses 3 8 all thread as the constricting factor, as the binding factor. And clamp the thing up under, you know, several hundred pounds of, of tension. And then mark the overlap of where it ought to be welded. Then remove the clamp, cut it off at the overlap, and then reclamp it together. And now I should have two clean butt ends coming together. And then weld the butt ends in situ. It'll burn the stump a little bit where it welds, but I can keep some water handy. It's not really going to cause a problem. We'll do one at the top, one at the bottom. Next thing, I want this thing to be on wheels. I'm going to install some retractable wheels where it can spend most of its time just sitting on the wood. But if I engage the wheels, I want it to roll around like a two-wheeled handcart. And finally, if it's going to have wheels, it's going to have the anvil mounted up here, then I also want a retractable handle. Think of a, a rolling carry-on suitcase where a handle comes up, grab the handle, tilt the thing over, wheel it around, put it wherever you want, put the handle back down. And lastly, of course, mounting the anvil itself. I'm going to do a little research of how anvils are generally mounted. I know you can use a piece of chain. I've thought about using, I have some extra aircraft cable. But with the cable, there's no real clean way to hook to it like there is with a chain. But we'll come to that when we get there. So I have one of these rotating Chinese vices with normal jaws down here and then pipe jaws here. And then the jaws here are shaped like a hex shape, like two opposing pieces of a hex shape. Like you would hold maybe a giant bushing or something with it, uh, of, a, of a pipe plumbing bushing, that big hex shape. I've never really figured out what the actual intended application is for that. Maybe that's a, a spud nut on a hydraulic cylinder. In any case, I've never used it, never had any call for it. So a while back I made a little permanent modification. It could be undone. These are a couple of timing belt tensioning pulleys that I ended up with after doing a couple timing belt jobs here in the, at the house. And this is a end of a, of a barbell that's just turned nice and round and then drilled for this pilot shaft. So on this side we have the shaft attached that I leave this thing lay on the floor. I don't leave this on the vise all the time. These two bearings stay here all the time. This sits on the floor and if I need it I grab it. And because this comes down right here in the center of these two, it makes a serviceable ring roller. So after I cut these apart, the first ring here is pretty well formed. I don't really need to do a lot with it but we'll give it a little final shaping to get it tighter. You know, as I, as I close the vise in, it applies a bend as it forces this roller between these. You 
see how the ring is closing up real nicely. I would say this one will be the final pass for this particular one. Now for the clamp. So to strap these together, what I'm going to do is weld a piece of angle iron. Weld angle iron here on this strap and drill a hole through it. Weld a corresponding piece of angle iron here and drill through there. Then a piece of all thread running through here and when you tighten the bolts together this way these two pieces of angle iron are drawn together. The only trick is that the hole needs to be very close to the face of the clamp so that we're not applying a bending moment to the angle iron but rather we are pulling the stretching the surface of the clamp and in order to do that we will probably have to put a tube standoff here so our actual turning nut can be out here okay so here's the configuration I'll, I'll be welding this will be welded back here which will apply pulling tension here and this weld will lock it in place I could um, screw it and thread it and then just remove the screw when I'm done Instead, I'm going to have to cut the weld when I'm done. I'm opting for welding just because it's fast and easy, and I'm not, you know, too in love with how this thing looks when I'm done. Then I have this spacer standoff, 3 8 inner hole. Don't really know where it came from. Some kind of scavenged equipment I tore apart. So this will be welded here. The spacer will go there, and then a long piece of all thread will come across the distance, a nut there, through here and a nut there and as I tighten it up it'll draw together and here it is ready to clamp up up I went ahead and pre-bent the all thread <clears throat> to get it to go through these holes the, the all threads disposable when we're done it's just a, a tool at this point to get this done tighten down on this screw it will draw the whole thing this way these should overlap and I think I should be able to get this thing really very snug around the trunk as I draw it up. So we'll put a wrench on it and get turning and see what happens. I think that'll work. <clears throat> I'm going to go ahead and mark it and cut it. Okay, so, so I've now cut and beveled these. So what I have to do now is clamp it up again, pull it up until these join, weld solid, then remove the all thread, cut these little welds, pull these off, and that piece is installed. And there it is. There's where I cleaned off the weld from the bracket. There was the butt weld. It's not a perfect weld, but it'll hold for 50 or 100 years. After that, all bets are off. Weld from the bracket. I did five evenly spaced 20 penny galvanized nails just to kind of, you know, lock everything together. So, it's actually upside down right now. So why is it upside down? Well, that's an interesting question because I cut this end a little more square than the other end. The way it is right now, as you can see, it's got a lot of rocking. I would need to take something like three eighths of an inch off one entire side. You know, it's the whole cut is off by about three eighths of an inch. 
real pain to do. I could set up a, a router sled. I did. I was sure to drive my fasteners down beneath the surface to leave that possibility open, but the more I think about it, what do I really care which end is up? This end is very close to being perfectly square. It stands up nice and straight. So this will be the bottom. That'll be the top. The next step up is the handle. <clears throat> As I mentioned earlier, I want a handle that is going to be across like this and be retractable to come up and down. So I have these, I think these are porch railing, deck railing pickets. They're, yeah, they're a tempered aluminum. And it just so happens that with a three quarter inch conduit, it's a decent telescoping fit. So this is a smidgen longer than I need. So all I have to do is figure out my offset spacing, weld here, uh, you know, cut this off three or four inches, weld here and here, and put these tubes inside, put a bolt or something through here so that it can't, you know, go past the, uh, the full extension point. And then for a handle, one of the things I carry home from thrift stores is solid brass candlesticks. Sometimes they're a buck ninety nine or sometimes seventy five cents, some silly thing. So this one is solid brass and it's hollow. So it's not great for turning or whatever, but it makes a good handle. Um, if you need to, uh, a spinner handle, a crank handle, or in this case, just a pulling handle. So I'm just going to mount this between these two shafts, basically here and here. Run a piece of quarter inch all thread through just to lock it together. And I ha happen to have some quarter inch brass acorn nuts, you know, to finish it off. That'll give it a nice kind of a finished look. And that will be the grip handle. All right, I chucked up a piece of aluminum in the lathe and turned a plug for this end. Comes down to about there. Keeps this tube from crushing when I apply the the, um, the tension of squeezing the handle on, and it softens this edge here so you don't have a sharp edge near your hand. And there it is. I uh, cut about eight inches off of these so that they will hit a stop somewhere around here. That's about the height that I want. That's where the handle will go. I'll cut a couple stubs of that EMT conduit and weld it, one here and one there. And then put some quarter inch bolts through here to act as a, as a catch so that it can't come all the way up. And there we have the handle. Extend it, tilt it, manipulate it, put it down when you're done. It has a nice grippy feel to it. I really like that a lot. Very pleased about that. All right, so I'm just documenting this as part of the process. I'm sitting here looking at these wheels. They're going to stick way out the side. It's going to take me a couple hours uh, of time, you know, to, to get both wheels installed, to get a working pin, to get the original pivot point freed up to where it can rotate and I'm just thinking before I do all that I think I should go ahead and mount the anvil to the stump and see how hard it is to move especially with this nice handle it occurs to me it can probably be drug around and basically on that piece of steel down there and if it's not too hard to drag the thing around then I think I'm really making it harder than it needs to be and I will just leave the wheels off of it and if you need to get it out or put it away you just drag it across the floor using that steel band as kind of a wear piece. I've done a little research just had a look at what's out there and you know there's a lot of fancy ways to mount your anvil to your sand but I think mine well it's pretty obvious there's a hole here and there's a hole there and you take a lag bolt with a big washer, maybe even a quarter inch thick washer so that you got something substantial, and you screw it down. It's not terribly exciting, but it should work like a charm. Big lag bolt, big fat washer, right there, and right there. All right, I'm very pleased with it. So I just actually took the cutoffs from this banding, drilled through it, 3 8 inch, 
and just use that as a washer and that has drawn down tight the uh, anvil is not moving uh, over time if it you know kind of sinks down into the wood a little bit and gets loose they can just be cinched up so I'm pleased with that I think that'll work great I'll hit those and the rest of this steel with some boiled linseed oil here in a little bit the final thing uh, when I did look up some pictures of anvil mountings I couldn't help but notice how handy it is to have some places around your anvil to hang some tools some common tools so I thought about putting an entire band around it you know with like an inch and a half offset so that you could hang things all the way around the problem is that it then gets thicker in the back and, and takes up more floor space when I try to you know put it back into a corner so what I've settled on and it's you know quick and easy is I have a little bit of this steel pipe and it's got a little bit of a, of a black powder coating on it. It almost looks anodized like it's aluminum, but based on its weight it cannot be aluminum. It's too heavy for... So anyway, I presume it's a mild steel. I'll know, I'll know when I try to weld it. But I'm going to weld on just some loops, a place to hold hammer and tongs. I will put one here at this quadrant coming off of this well, I'll, I'll put one at each corner of the foot, coming off of the foot. So here it is. I think it turned out very well. Uh, it's solid, it's secure, it's portable. I can see myself getting a lot of use out of it. I don't know when I'll first fire up a forge and actually hammer something out on it. But if nothing else, it'll be awfully nice to just have a proper height anvil just for the times that you just need to beat on something. So anyway, <coughs> hope you enjoyed the journey. And as always, thanks for watching.